U.S. Supreme Court, which overturns the 50-year-old Roe versus Wade judgment guaranteeing access to abortion across the United States, was described by the U.N. Human Rights Chief as a huge blow to women's human rights and gender equality. The sheer amount of tech tools and the knowledge required to discreetly seek an abortion underlines how wide open we are to surveillance. In the post row era of digital privacy, a moment that underscores how the use of technology has made it practically impossible for Americans to evade ubiquitous tracking. American legal context to provide protect healthcare data is covered by HIPAA, which hasn't been updated since I believe 2003 or 2011, yet for a long time. While most of the world either faces worse legal privacy conditions or suffers with a lack of data protection, Europe has recently expanded the definition of sensitive data to include health inferences. As the metaverse evolves and America grapples with post Roe versus Wade reality, what interventions are necessary to protect patients and citizens alike? What role can organizations, regulators, doctors, and citizens play at this juncture? As a woman, as an American, and as the cyber guardian for this tech ecosystem, I'm really looking forward to this next panel. It is essentially one of the most important conversations of our times as these wonderful women, some of whom I have had the honor to work with, discuss privacy, Roe versus Wade, evolution of the metaverse, and future of healthcare data protection. On this panel is first Vina Somaredi, who is the CEO of Neuro Rehab VR, a VR healthcare startup that builds virtual reality therapy exercises for physical therapy. Her accolades include being recognized as the top innovator in North Texas, Fast Company's world changing ideas honoree, and featured in Forbes and Cosmopolitan. She's also the recipient of a National Science Foundation grant and one of the top 10 startups chosen to participate in First Amazon Healthcare Accelerator. Using her many years of research and development experience in VR and AR, she's helping to connect technology and healthcare to enhance patient care and rehabilitation of graduates. Thank you for that introduction. And for it's sure. an honor to be here today. Thank you, Bina. And next is Julia A. Scott. Uh, Dr. Julia A. Scott is the Brain and Memory Care Lab Director at Santa Clara University. Dr. Scott's research program utilizes external partnerships in healthcare to develop projects at the intersections of neuroscience, medical imaging, and virtual reality application. She received her training in neuroscience at the University of California campuses. She has published widely on normal and abnormal neurodevelopment and brain aging, Dr. Scott is translating her BCI VR research into digital health application. She co-founded Gambit Labs in 2021 to empower youth to take the lead in ensuring their own well-being by developing specific cognitive skills. Underlying healthier habit of mind. Dr. Scott has, Scott has also assumed executive lead role today with Medical XR Advisory Council by XRSI. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for doing this courageous discussion. And next on the panel is Paula Pondo de Hill. I hope I said that correctly. Is an attorney in the United States admitted to practice in law in California and Guatemala, her home country. She holds a master's degree in computer science, computer and communication law from the Queen Mary University of London and is certified information privacy professional CIPP in both the US and the EU. With over 10 years of experience, she has worked as an associate at top three Central American law firm as an independent consultant and assistant manager at UCLA's Information Practices Department. She currently works as a privacy of counsel and advocates for Alasio Abdados and Consultor. Said that correctly, a leading Central American law firm in Guatemala where she heads data privacy and data protection practice in area. Paula's fierce passion for privacy, advocacy, and children's rights led her to become a 
XRSI's Child Safety Legal Advisor. She also serves as a leadership advisor to DDDX3 X Foundation, a diversity and inclusion task force advisor for apraxia kids, an independent special education advocate. Last but not least, moderating this remarkable panel, Deborah J. Farber. With early and growth state startup to craft go to market messaging that resonates with privacy, security, and data governance executives, evangelizes privacy by design and privacy engineering methodologies and tactics, and evaluates the use of distributed ledger technologies, verified credentials, and decentralized identifier for building ethical, transparent, and trusted technologies. Deborah thrives when she pours her passionate energy into building ethical ecosystem and communities. She brings her industry knowledge and ethical rigor to the world of XR as XRSI's privacy and safety program lead and XR privacy advisor. Previously, she has held privacy and security leadership roles at Amazon, AWS, Big ID, Visa, TrustArc, and IBM. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this historic moment. And thank you to these amazing women for their courage and their intellect to confront some of the most challenging issues faced by women today in the digital and the immersive era. Deborah and all of you, please take it away. Wow. Well, thank you for that introduction, Kavya. I really appreciate that. Um, I am delighted to moderate this panel today uh, with these incredibly knowledgeable women. Um, and so I guess we'll dive in because there's there's so many things to talk about. We could have separate panels on each topic, but we're going to try to uh, set the scene first from a legal perspective. Um, earlier this year, uh, as Kavya mentioned, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the Dobbs case has overturned Roe v. Wade and that eliminated a constitutional right to abortion, among other things like privacy generally. Um, many states have responded with laws that make abortion illegal in many or most circumstances. So Paula, before we turn to the application of you know, this issue to the metaverse, can you first give us your legal perspective on the risks that girls and women will face as a result of this Dobbs decision? Yes, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Kelly, for that amazing introduction. So let me provide a little more background for those in the audience that might not be as familiar with these cases. Um, Roe v. Wade's case brought up Supreme Court 50 years ago, like Kavya shared, and it decided that the U.S. Constitution provided an implied right to privacy, protected a woman's right to choose whether to have an abortion. So the ruling on Dobbs it overturned Roe, declaring that it, there is no constitutional right to an abortion, and then returned the authority to regulate abortion to the states. So the impact for girls and women with this decision is that a basic part of women's health care rights has now been banned or criminalized in at least 13 states as of statistics in October, according to a research presented by Jeff Jockish during Privacy and Equity Conference. The number is expected to rise to 26 states implementing these total or near total bans. This means girls and women in the U.S. also lost their constitutional right to privacy because in the U.S. there is no express federal constitutional right to privacy and the legal landscape is addressed differently across different industry sectors. Um, for those of you that have been participating, on Saturday, Human Rights Day reminded us that the right to health is a basic human right, and it includes the right to control one's health and body, including the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and girls without interference. In a post-war world in the US, women are no longer afforded equal rights to health. So as it was mentioned before, privacy is, is addressed differently across different industry sectors. So as of today, we're talking about healthcare. So let's see how privacy and security of healthcare data of an individual is regulated in the US. So first we have HIPAA. This is a comprehensive federal law that creates national standards to prevent certain health information referred to as protected health information or PHI from being disclosed without a patient's knowledge or consent. 
So its requirements are implemented through a set of rules around privacy and security of PHI and process for purposes of payment, treatment, and operations related to healthcare. So the main issue with HIPAA rules is their narrow scope because they do not apply to health information maintained by anyone who isn't a covered entity or its business associates. So following the Dubs decision, the OCR, which is the Office of Civil Rights, issued new guidance addressing HIPAA's protection of reproductive health information. So here, among a couple of other important points, it reiterated that HIPAA privacy rules permits covered entities to make disclosures that are required by law, not merely permitted without authorization. But what about entities that are not covered entities under HIPAA? President Biden also issued an executive order plus road and to guide how to protect the privacy, security, and safety of the millions of Americans who now have limited access to reproductive health care services. So again, what happens to those entities that possess this data and are not covered entities? In contrast, there are some non-HIPAA covered entity privacy practices that may be regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, so the FTC. This is the nation's consumer protection agency and it enforces section five of the FTC Act, which prohibits companies from misleading consumers by engaging in unfair or deceptive acts or practices in commerce. So for example, smartphone apps that monitor users' health data are subject to the FTC Act. The FTC also enforces the health breach notification rule, which requires certain businesses and nonprofits, which are not covered by HIPAA, to notify their customers, the FTC, and in some cases, the media, if there's a breach of unsecured, individually identifiable health information. So the FTC has also provided some guidance post OBS and has recognized that the most sensitive categories of data collected by connected devices, a person's precise location and information about their health. And then I'm not gonna go into it because this is not a legal lecture and I know that I've just delivered a lot to you to try and set the landscape. Uh, but there are also some entities that if you've been following today, it was mentioned earlier, that may receive reproductive health information from individuals, and they both fall outside of both HIPAA privacy rules and the FTC. And then we go into the FDNAC Act by the FDA, and I think you have enough to kind of see where we stand. Um, so you, I hope that I was able to, to express the complexity of the issues that girls and women now face in the U.S., because the applicable regulations often turn on the purpose for which the health data was collected and by whom, rather than the nature or sensitivity of the data itself. Privacy and health data are viewed as consumer rights and not human rights. So what happens to health data that falls outside of these purposes? What about health data inferences that can be made by personal data that might not be initially obviously related to a human's reproductive health information? can be derived with enough data points from the collection of massive amounts of personal data without a specific purpose. So I'm going to leave it here for now and hope that I was able to kind of lay the, the stage so that Julia and Dino can, can continue. Paula, that was excellent. That was really good. I mean, this is a lot of information that you were able to condense down uh, in a digestible manner. So I really appreciate that for setting the regulatory landscape for us. Uh, it's clear a lot has changed on the legal front, especially since HIPAA was uh, came 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 into law in 2003. Um, but now, uh, Vina, uh, I'd love to turn to you. Um, as a result of the Dobbs decision, privacy advocates and members of the medical community are concerned about potential for surveilling girls and women through the collection and use of reproductive health data uh, via personal apps. And of course, we're concerned about the surveillance of medical professionals who may assist with performing abortions. Um, Vina, can you give us examples of such risks in the medical XR context? And don't forget to unmute. Yeah, I could not hear the last part, but I'm guessing uh, you're asking about other areas with it. Yeah, if you can give us examples of um, risks to like the uh, doctors uh, or, or um, the potential for surveilling girls and women through the collection and use of their reproductive health data as applied okay. to the medical yeah. XR uh, context. 
it's breaking in and out, but I can uh, add my thoughts to this one. Thank you so much for the, all that information. Paul, that was really good. In general, you know, now we understand what happened with Roe versus Wade and we kind of have a template as to, it's, it's more of a cautionary tale for us to make sure that as we build these environments and as we work on the next generation of the metaverse, we have to think about what could happen with when different parties come with access to the health data that can be accessed through the metaverse. So in general, privacy risk and virtual augmented reality can arise from like collection use of personal data, such as location, biometric, and health data. So these risks can, can be particularly acute with uh, extended reality where you know, sensitive information can be collected. And especially with, we work with a lot of vulnerable population with people who have had strokes or brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, and sometimes they're not able to consent to the data that's being collected. So it's very important to make sure that either we do not collect the data or they understand exactly what's being collected and have control over that. And as more and more of uh, the metaverse is getting into training and uh, PD and also in the PTSD area and stress and anxiety therapy, which has been, has boomed uh, recently, especially in the military side, if they come out of the military, they could be in if there is access to the data that, you know, while they were in the DOD, uh, that would be bad for, you know, being able to uh, get insurance in the outside world. So that's something that we haven't probably thought about and in all of us having access to data. So we've had, uh, instances where people who have had a stroke are not able to drive, their uh, driving licenses are taken away and and only can get their licenses back after they go through a series of tests and then go back to the DMV. So it's already hard for a lot of people, but then there are other areas where, you know, insurances can be divided, uh, denied or it could be higher because of the data that they've had, you know, these institutions have of that person. And as the metaverse starts to permeate into more telehealth and psychiatry, it's really important to understand uh, both for the health professionals and the patients to make sure that the data that's being collected and having uh, access to it and also understanding what it is so that either the clinicians or the patients are not at risk. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, and Julia, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, data and collecting so much enormous amount of data. Um, can you help us understand some of the data types collected by personal apps and healthcare providers that could enable this tracking in a medical XR context? Right. Um, so with the use of XR, whether it be a mixed reality or device or a headset, um, other dimensions of data are collected um, that you wouldn't find in, in a telehealth uh, situation. It's, it's at a different dimension and different degrees. The other thing to consider is in that numerous medical applications of XR, the use of um, peripheral sensors is also incorporated. So when you put that together, um, when the device you're using has electrodes and um, light sensors um, and different types of cameras in combination with being on um, on a connected device, it, it expands the complexity of the type of information and the inferences that can be made from it. Um, so if we take, for example, the uh, the concept um, that Dr. Spiegel spoke about earlier on, which is being used in a point of care system, which is not matching it to a, to a particular person um, in that context in a point of care. But if that device was then used in a remote setting um, at home with the Omnicept, what data that would be potentially breached is um, the uh, with the eye scanning, it's going to be eye position, the eye tracking, the pupillometry, um, which is giving you cognitive load. You're simultaneously measuring heart rate um, in order to add that variable to the. You have all of the spatial information about how someone is moving around in that space. If we're considering, um, if we're considering a device like the. Uh, 
Quest Pro that's coming out with the, or any other mixed reality device with body tracking, you now have information about the physical space that they're in, a mapping of their um, of their home, um, if you're using it in a home setting, and the behavioral patterns that will emerge in that space. So it's giving much more information to a healthcare system or a provider than would previously be shared. Um, it would be similar to having a home visit by the clinician um, and going to their office, right? So when social workers and nurses and so on come to the home visit, they're going to see everything. Right? They're going to take that in, they're going to process it, they're going to make their notes. But now you have something completely objectively tracked with those millions of data points. Um, so this falls into the additional categories that we want to consider with the data types are going to be the behavioral patterns and the biometric data. So that's And so, you know, with more of this tracking, uh, it appears, you know, if there is data about, you know, women and girls or even their caregivers and what, you know, what they have access to, um, that's more potential for this information to be breached by third parties who have access to it. Or if some if police ask for a subpoena or, you know, have, you know, are there areas like when it comes to data collection, are there areas or specific data that's collected that worries you in a post Dobbs world specifically? Um, or is it just typically the, like the location tracking ability uh, and kind of monitoring where the person goes? Like, how does that relate to XR? Um, and how can it? Uh, what I think, oh, sorry. Whoever wants to jump in, I was gonna, I was just, yeah, I was gonna ask that we can to, both um, to answer you as a follow up. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say just to quickly case. do uh, what Julia said, it's almost like you can create a digital twin and identity of that person inside uh, mm -hmm. of the metaverse world. And as this uh, takes off and becomes mainstream, there needs to be new revenue models. And the revenue models that are being accessed right now is ad ads because that has worked really well for a lot of companies and that will probably start to permeate into the metaverse too. And as we have seen previously, all of these companies create an, a profile of you to understand what you what are your likes and what are your what you don't like, and give you the right kind of ads. And now you now they have even more information to do that with spatial mapping, biometric data, hand tracking, mm -hmm. and all of that. And then recently, when it, when you come to third parties having your data, which now, like I said, with Microsoft, I had to connect it to my Microsoft account, link it. I had no choice now there is more information there and third parties. Previously, what has happened with uh, one of the companies out there is uh, a tool that hospitals were using to you know, understand uh, patient information, that patient information was leaked to the third party company. So now they had information about patient health conditions, doctor appointments, and also medication. So uh, now they're understanding sensitive data as what medication the person is taking, which is really, uh, alarming to think about it. So now everything in the end is monetization and you're, again, you're giving away more and more of your data to be monetized. Got it, which doesn't seem like the right um, mm -hmm. focus on healthcare, for healthcare monetization exactly. of the patient. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily seem super ethical. Mm -hmm. um, Julia, if, if you wanted to also uh, give a thought, if not, I had a follow-up mm -hmm. for uh, Vina. Um, I would say that now, the new component here um, is, is the additional things that can be inferred from the constellation of data. So if you're trying to, um, someone is trying to figure out if someone is progressing through a pregnancy, um, you can figure that out with body tracking, um, with the gestural control. It's not just the gestural control, but the body tracking in general as posture change and, and other proxies for um, sense or true medical information um, is ex inherently exposed in the usage of, um, of these platforms and the applications. So that's, that's where I think there are new threats. There would be the same threats we see now, like if you're, I was noticing on Alt-VR, there's um, different meetup groups on different topics, right? The risk there of who you're meeting with, what things you're interested in, um, in the metaverse, that would carry over to the same similar ways that we use the internet, um, but the biometric data 
is um, is that new added factor um, where new new confident inferences can be made. So that's what I wanted to add there. That makes sense, including biometrically. I think this is so data. new. It's hard for us to understand what can be done with biometric and behavior of your behavior in the metaverse. The how that can be used. It's still very exactly. Good, I'm can... sure. As you go forward, Deborah, you want to jump understand in? that better. Go for it, Paula. Yeah. You want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to jump in. Like we already see with the latest decision by the Court of Justice in the EU, we're talking also about unstructured data, right? The, the health data inferences that can be made because they just expanded their own uh, definition within GDPR of what um, health uh, sensitive health information, now that you're talking about data categories, right? So, because now they have this um, determined that, you know, certain data can be used to infer a sensitive piece of information, even if it's unstructured. So, in this specific case, we're talking about the publication of the names of the spouses of certain people was able to determine and, and provide an inference of their um, sexual orientation. So, I just with what Julia and, and Dina are sharing, it is absolutely um, scary, the amount of health data inferences that could be potentially linked to reproductive health data happen with, with just the sheer amount of data that is being collected. And that makes sense. And um, as a result of, you know, biometrically inferred data and even psychographically inferred data, we at uh, XRSI, um, I, as, a, as my introduction, um, I'm, I'm the, the program lead for the privacy and safety program at XRSI. And uh, we have come up with a taxonomy of some new nomenclature that's needed for the XRR space. And um, we came up with a definition that matches, you know, EU definition as well. But we came up with our own and you could find on our website for biometrically inferred data for XR data. What does that mean? As well as, you know, psychographically inferred data. So, you know, definitely an area to pay attention to whether we're talking about, you know, a post Dobbs world, um, you know, uh, or, or any other related risk in the metaverse, um, but did want to, you know, plug our good work here at XRSI. Um, and then Vina, I wanted to turn uh, to you actually and ask, what stakeholders in the medical XR ecosystem have access to this health data? And you know, what are some of the concerns that you have regarding the high volume of data collection about patients um, in the metaverse? Sure, yeah. As you know, as creators of these environments and being in the healthcare space and selling our uh, applications, even, even us and other companies to the hospitals that uh, we, you know, one of our concerns is always to make sure that we are, we are not collecting any PHI and that's how we do it. We don't really need the patient information, but the other things that can be collected in most metaverse worlds is the range of motion, like movement data, and, uh, and so how the progression of the patient in rehab especially is what uh, one of the things that we work on and also working on their stress and anxiety. So those are all the concerns that we have as companies and as Tebra said, having that industry-wide shared responsibility model to make sure that there are uh, rules and regulations that we follow as to the kind of data that's being collected and who has access to it. And as Paula mentioned about the HIPAA, HIPAA is just the standard. Uh, some companies fully follow it, some do not. We put a lot of effort to make sure that all of our applications are HIPAA compliant, but there is there is that comes and does a test on your systems to make sure that you're HIPAA compliant. So we need better regulations to make sure that there is some kind of auditing process uh, on the companies to make sure that is it, it is actually HIPAA compliant, and then understand the kinds of data that's being collected. So other than that, you know, in the VR space, all of us have been talking about making our the metaverse more hardware agnostic and our applications more hardware agnostic. So there is the open XR framework to make sure that you know application that you build can be used on different headsets, but there's not much conversation on the framework that we need to follow for having the security and compliance around data. So I'm really 
glad that XRSI is working on it and they're uh, creating this framework uh, that we, all of us as companies that are building for the metaverse can follow. And then developing and enforcing the strong privacy laws is also important. It's not just creating them. So that's another challenge that we need to look into as we get into uh, being creators of metaverse and as this becomes more mainstream. And again, we have spoken about it, ensuring that users are really informed about the potential risk, privacy risks that they can have, uh, especially for using medical extended reality and giving them the ability to control. And this is where decentralization comes. We have to really work on open source applications and decentralizations moving forward, which is really, really important. We have made that switch in our company. We try to use tools that are open source. So we understand the code, we understand what's really happening then using more centralized applications. So decentralization is really important. And then implementing those robust security measures to protect that personal data from unauthorized actions, access. So there's ways to have roles and access within these applications and making sure that we are really strict about which, uh, who has access to this data. And then as coming back to HIPAA, the business associates can have access to the HIPAA data as long and, and third parties sometimes can have access to HIPAA data as long as they sign a form, which is not the best way to go about things. And then just encouraging everybody to make sure that they're having, you know, this following the framework as they're building new applications is really important and practicing that as part of the development process. Um, thanks for that. Uh, could, could you tell us also a little bit about, you know, like, do you have any concerns about where the data is stored? Like, and, and um, right. maybe how the yeah. terms of service. So when it uh, comes to a lot of healthcare data, the data is mostly stored on the cloud and uh, there are both Google, Amazon and Google have healthcare uh, compliant, you know, HIPAA compliant clouds, which is good, but it's still once it's on the cloud and once they do have access to it too, there's, you're really not sure about what's happening to it. So that's one thing. And then other data that can be collected VR headsets is voice data that we don't really think about. I make sure that whenever I use my Oculus headset, as soon as I'm done using it, I switch it off because it can always collect data on your voice and again, store on the cloud for most of the time. When we started this company, we actually didn't store any of our data on the cloud. It was localized, so it's much more uh, compliant and, and private. But as we started to grow, we had more people to make sure that we uh, we build systems that are more secure and more private, and that's when that's the that's when we switched to the cloud, and that's one of the big areas that we really can't stop that, but we can make sure that there are rules and regulations around it. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, so many builders of XR technologies want to enable. Uh, users to be anonymous where they are not identifiable. Um, you know, Paula, is being anonymous in the metaverse even possible? And if so, how can a medical XR patient be identifiable to their providers, uh, healthcare providers, uh, while remaining anonymous to other stakeholders in the ecosystem like software and device platforms? That's a really good question, Deborah. And um, I mean, I, I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges for this new iteration of the internet. Right? So currently, it is possible to be pseudo-anonymous metaverse because the way that technology is working often requires some linkage to an identity in order to function properly. Um, in the metaverse and, and XR, like we, there's already research that I think is from 2018, right? There's stats on Oculus VR and high-end systems record about 18 types of movements across the head and hands. And so consequently, spending 20 minutes in a VR simulation leaves with just under 2 million unique recordings of body language. So as, as the US legal lands, landscape stands today, um, it would Practically be impossible for a person to be truly anonymous due to the data inferences that can be made to re-identify an individual. I think at this point it's important to not only take into account the data inferences, but like Bina just uh, mentioned, 
who owns the data, who's controlling it, right? Um, it's being collected. Where does it stand? Um, and previous uh, panel discussions throughout today that were absolutely brilliant about like the impact of blockchain and DLT, or earlier the keynote speaker just talking about how they did get these software, but it's just with one set, right? And if you need to download another software, you need another set. And that's not sustainable, just like Dina explained right now, once you're growing and once you're expanding, you can't just maintain it. So I, I don't believe that the current landscape in the US in a post real world and the fact that the US lost and as they stand now would align with the possibility with, uh, for anonymity. So I truly believe that there needs to be a shift that recognizes and protects privacy. Just to privacy. Uh, quickly add to that, I agree with everything Paula said. Uh, it's just collect, not collecting data. And that's one of the practices that we actually employ in the company. We do not collect any PHI because we really don't need it. And uh, with that's our fantastic. patients that, that use our system, it, it's up to the clinician to be, you can add a nickname, you can just add a client ID. So we will never know who the client is and it could be just numbers and they have that data on their side. So they can connect that client ID, which is could be a series of numbers to that patient data. So it's never entered into the device. And so that way, there is no way that we can connect that patient to who that person is and, in real life. So that's, I think- that's, we are And that's a great principle Mm -hmm. That's a great principle. You know, that shift that we're that I'm trying to to explain is, is that data is minimization. That's what you're explaining, which is brilliant, because that is when you actually see privacy as a human right and not just a consumer right. 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 It just we are so used to giving away data at this point, even when for I'm on a different head site uh, for convenience, I try not to just blindly add all of my information in there. And I've also created a different email ID just for, you know, new websites that I might sign up to. That's my accounts. Really Perfect. appreciate that. I think it's clear that a lot of the platforms that have created uh, uh, virtual experiences uh, have not yet thought about the regulatory use cases in the healthcare context. And so no matter how great a healthcare app might be that's on a platform, you know, it, the platform itself is is going to determine what is ultimately collected. And so it's so important that we engage uh, the, you know, the the headset providers and the, you know, all the stakeholders in the ecosystem to, to really understand um, the implications around privacy and, um, you know wh where are the where are we building for the metaverse that doesn't that there's no supporting law for or that can, clashes with current laws? Uh, you know we're going to need a, I think one of the interventions is we'll have to come together to uh, to really work that out before uh, before there's harm to consumers. And I mean I guess to that point, uh, Julia, can you give us some examples of challenges to medical XR patients uh, compared to other users of metaverse devices and platforms? Um, and then if you can give a spin on, you know, uh, the post Dobbs abortion context, that'd be great. I know it might be hard to tie it together. Um, well, yes, we are in uncharted territory with the post Dobbs and also the other level of reproductive health in the metaverse um, it is one of those where it's a, at the core in-person care. Um, I think where there are new challenges um, with the medical XR and, and privacy here is, uh, is that transformation of um, telehealth to the metaverse. And there are, you know, there are companies est uh, established in this space like XR Health, um, House, uh, House Call VR, um, that are creating, creating that metaverse space for clinicians and patients to meet. Um, so that is what would normally occur within the privacy of, you know, the doctor's office. Um, we have models of this now in, you know, in telehealth and the Zoom calls or phone calls. Um, it, now with it being transformed to um, at a point of an avatar uh, interaction, there are, there's the need for 
um, that verification of identity. We just talked about anonymity um, with a, you know, a single single solution application um, for a specific uh, specific condition, something that's prescribed to you. But then there's the actual healthcare delivery delivery platforms that are on the metaverse, and that identity verification um, of who's on either end is. And that, and that authenticity is central, um, and the involvement of of other stakeholders that are involved, um, if it considers the patient and you partner, and so you now have three people in the metaverse or more um, exchanging personal health information. Um, for the care of, of the patients. And here you have that situation of choosing which platform to use, which device to use, and then who owns the data. Is it going to be, is it, is it going to be only with the um, with the healthcare system, um, the provider network? Uh, how does the patient have access to that data? What data is used and what data is is recorded? Um, because it's it's also like having a camera in the room where everything you do um, is somewhere up in the cloud. Um, so those are new uh, additional ways that uh, there are vulnerabilities. Um, and then Avina brought this up that when we think about who are going to be the users of um, of this new version of telehealth, it may be your busy, fully functional. Um, adult who just can't get the two hours to go to the doctor's office, but it's also going to be those who really can't get to the doctor's office um, and that have a cognitive impairment, a mobility um, issue, distance uh, to the clinic. And those those most vulnerable groups um, will be the most exposed uh, when using medical care on the metaverse and that other component of understanding consent. Um, and that's another another thing that needs to be layered in uh, to the delivery on the of care on the metaverse. Does that address the question a little bit more. You you no you did a great job. I just forgot to take myself mm -hmm. off mute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. No, this is great. So so far we've we've just covered a lot, and we're finally getting to some of the meat and potatoes of this conversation because uh, I'm going to ask you each to give like short answers uh, to this next question. But, you know, now that we've discussed a lot about the current state of privacy risks that are kind of unique to the medical XR, what interventions do you think are necessary to protect both patients and citizens in the metaverse? Um, I'll start with Vina. Oh, okay. I can go first. Yeah, I did, uh, or uh, I can, you uh, can go last, whichever. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did touch upon this a little bit before. I think one for healthcare organizations, understanding the scope of data that can be collected in the metaverse is crucial, because right now, you know, when we do center hospital systems, we do com we do complete two hundred hundred child risk assessments that they do send us, and it's all based on how it has been in the two D world. And none of these questions entail anything that's related to the 3D world. And that's something that really needs to change. It, it cannot take 10 years for that to happen. Uh, it needs to happen now uh, as companies are selling uh, data that can collect 3D information. Uh, How that's do you the suggest they come together, like the, the, um, the XR providers as well as like the healthcare providers? How What kind of forums? Um, I mean, XRSI is a perfectly great, great one. Right. But I, <laughs> Maybe for that's the thing. It does not exist at this point. XRSI mm -hmm. is a good one. I don't think healthcare together with the organizations that are about you know two thousand, three thousand hospital systems with hundreds of locations each, in just in the United States, it's really hard for them to all come together and agree on something. We have, we've understood that previously. Coming you know when it comes to when it, digitization of EHR data, it took a long time for it to actually happen, and now everybody's kind of on board, you know, it's it's done, it took a long time, but I think it's a way for the chief information officer, the chief, uh, you know, security officers of these hospital systems to kind of come together and understand this is going to become mainstream. We need to form some kind of framework and one, educate themselves on what the thing is 
and it's all responsibility of the creators and companies to also work with them and regulators to make sure we're creating these frameworks that we can one we, we should be able to implement them it cannot be that complex that as a startup or a small business it's not implementable but you know start somewhere and then kind of add on top of that so i that's something maybe xrsi can take on uh but i at this point i not don't think it exists. Other than that, you know, working with regulators, regulators understanding uh, the data and the privacy risk of uh, the metaverse. They've done a pretty good job right now with FDA understanding that XR is beneficial to patients. So there has been a CPD for physical uh, using virtual reality for physical therapy and behavioral wealth, which is really amazing for the whole ecosystem, the healthcare space as a whole. I'm glad FDA is taking that on. So. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. Of, I, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I you can stop out. right there. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you finish? I'm so sorry. It, it couldn't hear. Oh, no worries. And I think just, you know, with the citizens part, just having control over your data and understanding what's being collected, I think all of us would be happier to understand, you know, what's being collected. I think that's the fundamental part that we still need to work on. I think that all makes sense. So what I hear is that uh, you think that there needs to be um, some threat modeling going on within organizations to understand the use cases, both from those building the products as right. well as, um, you know, I guess the, the security, data governance teams, privacy officers, all mm -hmm. that, like just get everyone's heads together internally, but there needs to be some sort of external framework as well that can be followed exactly. for the industry. Um, Awesome. So I'm going to ask the same question to uh, to you, Paula. Um, you know, what interventions do you think are necessary to protect both patients and citizens in the metaverse? Let me just go back to to really understanding privacy, right? So it needs to be um, new standards that embed privacy by design and privacy by default to medical XR. And we need to add this to the other principles that I've mentioned and Vina has mentioned so accurately, um, and just to give them the legal names if you want, you know, data minimization, purpose limitation, these principles are key to be able to have the right interventions. Um, transparency is another big one that has been mentioned thankfully throughout this incredible ever safety week and, you know, from a viewpoint, right, I did it global south, I didn't grow up here. And so as citizens, there needs to be education and awareness of, of the changes linking it to this post row world, right? That rights have been diminished. There's less rights for women and girls in this country now. I grew up in a country like that. And you look up here and, and think that, things are gonna be different. So there needs to be awareness, participation, education, and having hard conversations like we're doing today. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And I totally agree. Um, Julia. Yeah, I think um, Vina and Paula have covered most of most of the topics. I'm trying to come up with something original here. Um, I, I would, what I would want to see um, in like the next generation of metaverse integrated in the healthcare systems is that there becomes a department and a position to actually um, manage that component of it that doesn't exist right now. So when it comes from the usage of metaverse to for the providers, for the clinicians on how to use it um, in the safest way possible, and then also educating the the patients and the users on um, on the on those same topics, and to put in those guardrails at the implementation stage. Um, but I think it's going to require more than the current IT departments and nurses. Um, and so much falls on on the nurses and and the social workers. And being a, a metaverse privacy technologist is not in their job description. So um, I think that's the yeah. additional component that will come in the future. 
Oh, I just I, think I just, you just created out a new title. <laughs> Metaverse privacy officer. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I think a few people in the room have that title right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah. um, so with that, I was going to ask another question. Actually, I'll just um, pare it down and make it a, um, a follow on for you, Julia. Uh, what about citizens? What can citizens like just your everyday person or even doctors, you know, just taking off my more legal focused hat where I'm looking at the, the obligations of those who are creating the software or hardware and, or, or the regulators who, who you know, we, we want government mm -hmm. to potentially regulate. What about just your, your doctors and just everyday citizens? Um, what role can they, you know, play at this juncture when it comes to mm -hmm. the metaverse and um, managing risks of, you know, around location data and, mm -hmm. Um, any risks there? Um, yeah, go ahead. I think one component is is in inviting them to the table with the builders and the regulators um, that they need to be um, involved in those companies. And we see many examples of that in the network here, um, but that they are central um, in being that check on how it needs to be used, um, where where those, where the, what are the essential components and what are peripheral and just add more risk. Um, so I think, I think that's a key component of it. Um, and then I think another lens that we can apply to this when we're looking at this intersection of healthcare and then data protection in the design of these systems and the selection of which applications to use um, as interventions or treatments is through the lens of invasiveness. Uh, when we're looking at other aspects of medical care, you have your least invasive to most invasive um, approach to solving the problem, uh, to treating the disease. So one aspect of invasiveness is invasiveness and privacy. So um, adding that to the criteria of how, um, of how things are selected for usage in the formularies, and essentially formularies, digital formularies. So that's, that's what I would that's say. That's absolutely true. I, I agree um, that we need a lot of um, stakeholders at the table and people should really be aware of the risks of, the, of this technology that they're, um, they're, they're using, even in the healthcare context. Um, okay, so we're at the Q&A portion of this panel. Um, please click the hand ra or raise hand button uh, if you are within the, uh, the Taj Mahal metaverse. Um, and ask away if you have any questions. Um, and I don't see any hands raised yet, but Kavya, maybe you have a, a question teed up. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, hey, uh, first of all, yeah, thank you once again for you know taking this challenging subject and dissecting it and then reflecting over what is to come, what we need to expect. Um, but in terms of like really calling out um, whose responsibility is it to collectively, because, you know, sometimes I'm hearing uh, it should be, you know, XRSI's responsibility or should it like White House responsibility or should it be the hospital's responsibility, they're not equipped, etc. I wonder, can we describe this? Are we in a position as four of you with your collective knowledge to be really prescriptive to whose responsibility is it to confront the fact that we in certain states are totally vulnerable, have no rights, and whatever needs to be done, whose responsibility is it? Is the White House needs to step in? Because we are going to hear from Cyber Director tomorrow at the opening keynote, and hopefully, like, we need to make sure these people are listening, but who's responsible if we were to specifically call this collective shared responsibility out so the women can no longer be vulnerable and can be safe? As one of the creators and as a company, you know, I say one, it, it is everybody's responsibilities, but I think it starts with the companies and the creators itself. Uh, it's, one, like as you spoke about not taking data that you don't need, that's the first part, and then having rules and regulations on where and how it is shared, uh, which is every company can do that. It's just about 
how greedy you want to get and what you want to do with that data. So just having that ethical way of looking at data is one way to start off. And then uh, I would say make, and then maybe giving that, uh, you know, control for the citizens itself so that they understand what's being collected as one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the in those who I mean, obviously, everybody's going to have some level of responsibility, even even users, right? And to do to follow the directions, the terms of service, to do the right things that uh, within the app as they're as they're told how it works, you know, to to make the right settings and such. So everyone's going to have their own set of responsibilities, but uh, I think we need the builders of the technology and all those stakeholders to threat model for how data is used, by whom, under what conditions, um, <clears throat> because you can't architect your applications without going through that process. So if you're not threat modeling for uh, physical safety based on you know, tracking of location data, uh, then anyone who's using that product won't necessarily have um, controls in place to adjust for that because it was not thought about, um, which is why threat modeling is so important. So I, I definitely agree with what I think it was who said before that, you know, you're, you're get the security people, the, the, uh, the govern, the data governance folks, uh, your, your privacy people, your accessibility folks, get all the right stakeholders at the table in a commercial sense so that you could have, um, that conversation uh, before you even build the product, not afterwards. You can't just bolt security and privacy and safety on afterwards. So that's my tidbit. That's my words of wisdom is uh, we're going to need in order to keep companies um, ethical uh, and, and actually adhering to human centered design, right? Not about ad centered design or what's the best way to make money off the backs of patients, right? <laughs> like the point is that you have humans at the center and we should respect their choices and about how data is collected, if data is collected, when it's collected, for how long, all of that, um, that all starts with the source of the data collection. Um, so, so that's important, but we need the regulators too, to be able to, you know, um, ha set a baseline of what is acceptable. And it would be great if they work together uh, on a global stage so that we can have it. Uh, I want lawmakers because we're talking about women and girls health care rights these are human rights these are basic rights and if they are not protected um like you're saying yes the creators and everything they need the standards they need the guidance they need to embed privacy by design and privacy by default and like Vina mentioned and julia we need to get all the stakeholders at the table uh, but there needs to be law that protects these rights, like the one that was just passed yesterday for, for protecting um, same-sex marriage. That's, that's the reality. We need to protect women's health care as a human right, and there needs to be law for that. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah. to maybe end this panel, what do you think, uh, Julia? Um, I wanted to underscore what Paula said, that the we can't leave out the the government aspect of this and not just regulatory policy or guidelines, um, which at the end of the day are um, in one day, one way voluntarily or other ways you can work around it, but enforceable laws. Um, without, exactly, enforceability. Without, without consequences, um, without some authority over private sector or even um, in public health care systems, uh, things will inevitably go amiss. Um, so that importance of enfor enforcement um, can't be ignored. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that closes our panel. Um, we It looks like we have one minute left. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for uh, you know, coming today and, and listening to what we have to say on this incredibly uh, complex topic. And um, uh, yeah, there's our one minute left. So do I, do I, does anyone have a word of wisdom that they'd like to add <laughs> on this, on the stage? Just shout it out with our 60 seconds left. Okay. Maybe not. So we'll just, um, we'll look pretty. For actually, you. Oh, go ahead. Kind of cut out in the end. I actually don't 
hear what you said. Oh, I just said if uh, we have like 20 seconds left. So if somebody wanted to say, you know, you had another thought, um, you wanted to leave the audience with, go for it, just shout it out. Oh, got it. No, I just want to thank a, yeah. this panel. Yeah. This incredibly talented women that are leading Nicole XR. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Vina, for everything you're doing. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, same here. Like, thank you, Julian, oh, Paula, and also to, Deborah. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, even though a lot of this was on the threats and, and the bad things that can happen, to not walk away scared of, of the medical metaverse, that there's still so much good that comes with it uh, and so much added value to, to everyone involved. So Excellent point. I mean to scare uh, you I'm optimistic. <laughs> And let's leave it on a positive note as well. There's risks. We can surmount them if we bring the right people to the table. So great clarion call right there. And with that, I think we bid you adieu. Everyone. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, ladies. And now, um, as we include Let's take a 10 minute break and then we will come back with our closing panel and uh, conclude the day four of Metaverse Safety Week. Thank you everyone watching online. Thank you for sticking around in the in world as well as thank you ladies for this wonderful conversation and a very urgent and important discussion. Thank you.